Welcome everybody to the Learn to Play Vason on our Alchemy VTT platform. I, my name is Dan Munoz. I am the content producer over here at Alchemy, and I am here with my illustrious uh, compatriot, uh, Vinny, and he will introduce himself here in just a second. Uh, but we're going to take some time to introduce you to not only our platform, but how to play Vason on our platform. Uh, if you like this content, stick around as we are going to uh, be doing this more often here in the future. Um, but until then, uh, Vinny, go ahead and take it away as we intro our our show here. Sounds good, Dan. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Vinny. I'm the head of customer success here in Alchemy. And for the next maybe roughly hour or so, uh, Dan and I are going to take you through a couple areas of the platform. Um, specifically, we're going to start with me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the platform at large and some of the different tool sets in it to really help uh, you run your gameplay experience. And then we're going to kind of transition over to Dan, who's going to speak a little bit more about Vason specifically, talk a little bit about the game's rule sets, our integration with it, and kind of between both of our sections here, we're really kind of hoping that by the end of it, you have a pretty good understanding of how Vason works in Alchemy, how Alchemy works at large, and how you can take this to your gaming groups and get started on Alchemy in minutes. So uh, without further ado, uh, just to speak a little bit on the platform real quick, Alchemy is a virtual tabletop. You've probably heard the term before, uh, but we have a very specific focus on cinematic immersion and theater of the mind gameplay, uh, because sort of at the end of the day, we crafted this platform uh, with this idea that um, uh, the tools and everything you need to kind of move through an RPG's story should be secondary to the story itself. And so we have a, a platform that really helps you focus on the immersion and the cinema of these stories that are kind of unfolding between you and your gaming groups. Um, and, and so as we sort of dive into uh, the different features and, and kind of the different aspects that really make Alchemy shine and makes it unique in the space, uh, you'll kind of see uh, that as sort of like an overarching theme um, present across all the different things that we're doing here. So just to kind of get started here, what you're seeing is the Alchemy homepage here. Right after you create an account at alchemyrpg.com, um, you can go ahead and uh, enter this page where you'll see uh, you know, a couple uh, navigation uh, tools here on the left, um, as well as the sort of create new game button on the right. Now for the purposes of our presentation today, um, we're going to specifically be talking more about the gameplay experience. We're not gonna get into some of the other feature, set, feature sets around streaming, around universe content, um, or a marketplace. Um, we'll specifically talk uh, mostly about gameplay today, give you a good game master overview, and we'll even speak a little bit to how that view differs from a player's view in the same game. So uh, speaking with Vason as our core example, and assuming I have the Vason core rulebook uh, redeemed on my Alchemy account, I can go ahead to this create new game button right here and go ahead and click it. This will bring up our kind of quick start for a game where I can give it a game's name. We'll just call this our Vason workshop game, uh, workshop game. Uh, for the system itself, we have all the systems here um, that I have access to in my Alchemy account. Um, we're going to go ahead and select Vason specifically since that's the rule set that we want to play. And then if I wanted to, I can filter through any of the uh, modules that I purchased for Vason. In this case, I have the Alchemy Enhanced Edition uh, of the Vason Core Rulebook, uh, which comes with all the information from the Core Rulebook and some extra little goodies, some additional assets, both um, you know, uh, sound, audio, video, um, and photos that really kind of help immerse uh, my players in the game if I want to leverage those uh, as I'm telling the, the stories at the table. So I'm going to go ahead and enable that Core Rulebook. Uh, and just like that, I'm going to go ahead and start my Vason game right here. What you're seeing first and foremost is the game's lobby screen. Um, here's where you can kind of preview your uh, your camera, your audio levels, make sure that everything's sort of good to go there. Um, you can back out using the little back button here. You can adjust the audio of the game uh, using this button right up here to kind of turn the music and sounds up and down as needed. Um, and then if you have any content warnings or if anyone else has joined in the game, you'll be able to see that information down here. When you're looking good, when you're ready to rock, um, you can go ahead and click the Join Game button, and you're going to be brought into the uh, game experience as a game master of that game since you're the one that actually ended up creating it. Uh, to kind of get things started here, and I'll go ahead and enable motion, um, you can see we have this sort of UI um, that has a scene playing in the background, which I'll go into in a little bit, uh, as well as a bunch of different panels uh, kind of going around the screen. Before I do anything at all, I want to be able to make sure that my players are invited to my game. So we're going to just start real quick by selecting the gear icon down here. I'll go to a little more in depth on this in a couple minutes, but just to get started, we'll go to edit the game itself. 
we'll go to the players tab and let's say i want to uh, bring my little buddy here dan aka nat one fun into my game i can go ahead and add a player by username um so in this case i will add dan's account which is nat one fun i'm gonna invite him and i'm also gonna uh, invite his uh test account which is nat one productions as well uh after that, after I've added them, you can see uh, that I've brought Dan into the game. If I want to, I can always promote uh, Dan as a game master. If for some reason, I want to kind of hand him the, uh, the reins for this week's uh, session. Uh, or I can even remove players from my game on this screen as well. Um, finally, uh, when you first join your game, you'll normally see a little link pop up. Um, that you can also distribute to your players. You can also grab that link here. And if you don't want to invite people by their Alchemy username, once they've already created an account, you can just send them this link as well, and it'll bring them into the game all the same. So with Dan in my game, with the, the game kind of set up, um, we're going to go a little bit into the panels around the screen. Again, this is the Game Master's view specifically. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go around the horn here, and I'll see if I can pull up uh, any specific callouts as needed. Um, you know, to how the player's screen uh, might differ just a little bit here. Um, the other thing too is that we're looking at a screen specifically around running vase and games. So if you're running different RPG systems in Alchemy, um, some UI elements might look a little different as well, but they're by and large uh, generally gonna be uh, the same throughout. And, and you'll see that once you really dig into the system yourself. So getting started over here, we have our journal panel. Uh, and that's specifically kind of taking up the Game Master's entire right side here. The journal panel is very simply kind of a message board. Uh, if I want to type a message to everybody in the game, I can go ahead and you know type that, say hi, and it'll be distributed to everybody. Um, similar, uh, if Dan wants to message me back as well, he can message there. Um, and I see those come through as well. Uh, you can also do other things like roll dice without getting too deep into the commands um, that are capable within the journal panel. I can type slash roll or slash r uh, 2e6 if I want to do something like that. And it'll actually roll those dice uh, directly in the journal, uh, showing you the results of the individual die, as well as the kind of total for the roll as well. Moving kind of from the journal panel, I can go ahead and click the notes tab up here to bring up the notes panel. Notes are very simply just kind of like your sticky notes. Let's say that as a game master, you come up with an NPC very last minute. You say that you come up with this uh, woman named Delilah, and she has auburn hair. I can go ahead and just uh, type that as a note very quick here and enter it. And then I immediately have this note that I can sort of access in my notes panel at any time. Notes persist. Um, you'll always keep them and nobody else can see your notes. So players individually each have their own separate notes panel as well as the game master. Um, and so you can always reference your notes. You can always edit them and change them using the edit button or by right clicking on them. Um, so you can kind of store that information if you just need to um, sort of rip a note out of your mind uh, so you can get back to narrating the story that's kind of unfolding before you. Moving around, um, generally players will have some panels in the bottom left as well. The Game Master doesn't have anything extra there at the moment, um, but uh, the panels players should see will generally have to do with um, helping them kind of run their character, be it the character sheet. So I believe for Basin specifically, we have panels around managing the equipment and the resources in your inventory, um, as well as uh, uh, rolling any skill checks um, related to the skills as part of a player's character. Um, we'll go a little more into some of the player stuff when Dan uh, gets into his section, as um, he's going to be kind of showing the player's screen a little bit during his uh, portion. So you'll be able to see those differences when we kind of get there. Moving around to the center bottom of your screen, uh, we have three buttons here and kind of left to right, we have a gear icon. We have this big what white uh, floating action button and we have a mute button as well. Going, uh, starting with the big one, the gear icon is basically your game settings. And if you click it, you can pull up a big menu with many different options. We're gonna start uh, real quick, quick game, does exactly what you think it was. Um, you can quit a game, pull yourself back to the home screen, and then from the game library here, you can go ahead and relaunch your uh, game and bring yourself right back into it. Uh, going up from there, uh, you can crawl up and hit the edit game option. You saw me do this earlier when I wanted to invite Dan to my game. Uh, and we have a bunch of different tabs here related to the game's uh, settings. First, uh, we have the game tab. You can use this tab to edit a lot of the uh, global settings for your game. It could be the name. You can give your game a little bit of a description. Um, if you want to change the artwork of the thumbnail when you're selecting your game from the homepage, you can go ahead and change that there. 
You can change the theme of the, the user interface. So in this case, because we launched a quick start using Vason, um, we can go ahead and actually change to the default Alchemy theme. And it'll kind of make things a little more blue and gold, which are kind of our core colors here at the company. Um, but you can change the theme to any uh, universe theme uh, you know that you have access to um, within this game. And I'll go into that in just a second. Um, past that, the current settings we have here for this game is that we can allow watchers or spectators in the Alchemy app to actually join your game from their home page and kind of watch everything happening. Uh, you can toggle private game master roles. So uh, if you wanted to, for any reason, uh, hide your roles, maybe you're a GM that likes to fudge dice every now and again, you're free and able to do that. You can save journal messages so that um, instead of your journal clearing every time you join a game, messages persist between sessions. And then finally, we have toggles here uh, if you wanted to uh, enable either voice, video, or voice and video chat um, for your games to use those particular AV tools in the platform. Scrolling back, um, we've also got our players tab, which you saw me go over a little bit earlier between adding players with their Alchemy username or distributing a link um, to add players to your game. The content tab is where you can actually add uh, additional books, basically. Um, uh, that you might have preloaded in Alchemy into your game and, and leverage those uh, objects uh, within your narrative. Without getting too deep into universes, universes in Alchemy are kind of like book collections that hold a bunch of different modules, and modules are almost like the individual books themselves. Vason uh, has a universe, and we had already enabled it when we created the game. Uh, we also have this little custom universe that Dan and I also created. Maybe we have some homebrew content and homebrew NBCs that we want to pull into um, our gameplay experience, maybe for a one shot we wrote. I can go ahead and actually enable that universe in this game as well and save my change by hitting the check mark down here. And now I can actually reference that content um, in this game the same uh, way I'd reference the core rulebooks information. And you know, I'll show you how that uh, uh, sort of works a little bit more when I get to some of the other objects that are contained within universes. Uh, finally, uh, one of the bigger things around here is that we're pretty uh, bent on uh, making sure that there's a good amount of safety tools within Alchemy to make sure that everyone's having a fun and safe experience playing TTRPGs with their friends or maybe people they don't even know. And so we actually have three safety tools in the platform, and two of them you can actually kind of see from this page. The first one we have here is Lines and Veils. And so to kind of uh, put it simply, Lines are sort of... Um, topics that can come up in a TTRPG game uh, that maybe can be referenced and, and maybe they are part of the story, but they can kind of happen behind the screen. They can happen, you know, behind, you know, a fade to black part of the narrative where it doesn't really need to be the forefront of what's happening in front of everybody, but it can be acknowledged. Uh, veil, or I'm sorry, veils are that. Um, lines specifically are um, uh, things that absolutely cannot be crossed no matter what, um, you know, and you don't want to... Um, uh, reference those at all in the game because it's just not fun. Uh, and so as you can see here on Dan's uh, Alchemy account, um, he had set up some lines and veils for his account, uh, as well as maybe some of the other players in the game. And the game master or the player can come to the screen and view all the lines and veils of every player and game master in this game. Um, to So they can kind of make sure uh, they know where the narrative can go and where it shouldn't go, um, you know, long term as as the story unfolds. Uh, finally, we also have uh, uh, content warnings as well. So we can go ahead and flag a game as mature. Um, you know, if we want people who may be spectating the game to know that um, this game uh, explores some mature themes. And we can also add content warnings. So let's say that um, my game might uh, have something to do with bugs or something like that. I can go ahead and add bugs as a content warning and save that change. And now whenever a spectator, a player, or a game master joins the game, They'll actually be presented with the content warning, um, you know, directly here. So they sort of know what they're getting into before they expose themselves to the content itself. Finally, um, the last sort of uh, tab we have here is streaming. It's a little empty right now, but we're creating this uh, entire streaming suite of tools. Um, so you can actually stream your Alchemy games on your favorite uh, streaming platform. Uh, you know, to, to show off your tabletop games uh, to anyone who uh, is interested in watching them. Kind of moving on as well, um, we also have the X card here, which is our third uh, safety tool, uh, past lines and veils, as well as content warnings. And what I can do, and any player can do right here in the game settings, is we can click the X card and send an X card anonymously to the rest of the group. Um, if Dan's going to do it real quick from his screen right here, 
um, you'll basically see that uh, the X card is essentially a tool where someone may not like where the story is going. Um, maybe it's making them a little uncomfortable and they can anonymously send a notification to everybody else in the game, basically letting them, them, them know, hold up, someone's just not comfortable with where the narrative is going and everybody from there can kind of acknowledge that and shift the story away from the problematic content. Um, it's completely anonymous um, and again, just sort of yields to more comfortable uh, tabletop experience for everybody at the table. Moving from there as well, um, maybe some people are uh, photosensitive and a lot of motion effects that really kind of make Alchemy pop are not maybe the best thing for them to experience. You can always disable motion specifically for you. And as you saw when I just did that, the smoke started or stopped uh, coming up from under the vase in here. The lantern stopped moving around um, and it just sort of uh, uh, cuts all motion effects uh, from the platform, um, you know, to sort of uh, uh, ease that type of content uh, for anyone who needs it. Uh, finally, we'll have another shimmer mode toggle here when that's ready. And then the help uh, option right here is really important as well. Everybody has access to it. And if you click it, it'll actually bring you to the alchemy knowledge base. Dan and I are going through a ton of content uh, during this workshop, but we're not going through everything. So if you have any other questions, maybe for instance, you saw me do that role command, you want to know what other commands are in alchemy, you can go ahead and explore our knowledge base specifically um, to uh, maybe read up a little more closely um, on what some of those additional commands are. Like in our chat article, for instance, uh, you can scroll down and see that there's a lot of different role commands that you can do um, and even more to go from there. From there, shifting to the kind of next button from the gear to the floating action button, this is basically your dice uh, tray. Uh, for any player or game master, if you click this button, you'll be prompted to roll any amount of dice uh, related to uh, the game that you're being played. Uh, in this case, because Vason is a D6 pool system using the Year Zero engine, um, we actually have buttons here uh, pre-programmed to roll any number of D6 that you might want to do. Um, so for instance, if I want to roll four D6, I just click the button right here, and you'll see that all of these uh, dice roll in the journal for everybody to see. And for this roll specifically, I had one success. If I want to drill down a little bit more into the roll's information, I can click the card in the journal, and it'll provide me with all that information there as well. And then finally, we have our little mute and unmute button right here. It does exactly what you think it would if you had voice enabled for your uh, Alchemy game. Um, you'll be able to mute and unmute yourselves as needed. Um, when you're using our native app, when you're not in a browser, you'll have a little carrot icon here to uh, pick the particular input you want to use. And if you're in a browser, it's just going to default to whatever default microphone is being set um, you know, through that particular browser. Uh, before I go any further, I know I've been talking for a little bit. Just want to kind of check in on chat here. Everyone following along well. Um, anyone need uh, uh, just a quick second? Um, you know, all four. Uh, you know, just want to check in with you all and see how you're doing. All good. Sounds good. So far, so good. This is great. Perfect. All right. Um, we'll keep sort of ripping around the game master experience here. Then, so from the middle here. We're going to go to the bottom right panels here. And so we have four panels here as a game master. We have the scenes panel, the story panel, the GM actions, and handouts. Um, for players specifically, these panels are going to look a little different. I believe for Vason games, um, they should have a trackers panel, which I'll go into what trackers are uh, in a little bit here. And they'll have their own handouts panel, which I'll also explain once I get to the game master's handouts panel. Um, so scenes, uh, just to kind of start, are the sort of cornerstone of what makes Alchemy uh, unique. As you can see here, uh, since we sort of started uh, sharing our screen here, uh, we've had this really cool image of uh, someone hunting a vasin with, uh, you know, a, a pistol and a lantern. Um, and it's been animated and moving. And if I had sound on, um, you can actually hear a little music coming through as well. Uh, scenes are basically what allows you to do all that. Uh, if you go ahead and right click any scene in your game, or if you go ahead uh, and go to the add scenes button at the bottom of any scenes that are currently loaded into your game, you can either select any scenes from any universes enabled in your game, remember from the contents tab of the game settings. So you can go ahead and uh, enable any scene that we have created as part of the core rule book. Or in our case, because Dan and I had our own universe that we enabled a little bit earlier, we can actually go ahead and select a scene that we want to implement maybe from that universe from our homebrew game and add that scene by hitting the, the button down there. And just like that, I can go ahead and play the scene, um, which will automatically show it off to all of the players in the game that are logged in. 
So it's pretty great. Um, it's basically how you can sort of control uh, the sort of narrative and take it to different locations or, or create different types of vibe and uh, different immersion, uh, you know, aspects and elements for, you know, wherever the narrative decides to go. Um, within the scene itself, um, you can always right click them, you can play them. Uh, if I wanted to as a game master, maybe I'm just trying to make sure things are good for where the story is going next. I can always uh, preview a scene as well by either right clicking, um, you know, and clicking preview in the menu or left clicking and then clicking preview down here in the center of my screen. And what a preview will do is it'll allow me to actually kind of view a scene um, as it will be presented to my players, but before the players can see it. Um, so while I see the Dance of Dream scene here, everybody else is actually still being streamed to cat scene. Um, so I can just make sure it, it feels good, it sounds good, it looks good um, before I send it off to my players if I need to, you know, make something ad hoc um, based on where the narrative goes. And then I can click that X button to dismiss the scene um, and bring me back to the present. Um, so those are scenes just kind of in a nutshell. Um, again, you know, as you cr uh, create them, um, you can give them location information, uh, add music to them, uh, sounds, different overlays. Um, animated effects. Uh, so for instance, if I didn't want this scene to be any, uh, if I didn't want this scene to be foggy, uh, maybe I just want to add like a fire effect because a uh, building's burning down. I can go ahead and scroll to my uh, fire motion effect overlay, hit uh, uh, select that for the scene, save the scene itself. And then the scene will replay, but now instead of the fog, it actually looks like the tavern beneath the cat is on fire. And so it's a really cool way to kind of add these additional um, uh, motion effects into the game itself. So that's the anatomy of a scene, um, more or less. Moving over to the story tab, if I play Dance of Dreams here, uh, this scene is actually kind of a collection of information related to uh, the uh, adventure by the same name that's sort of in the back of the Vason core rulebook. Uh, so if I go to the stories tab while I'm playing the scene, we actually have all of the information here that I would need as a game master uh, to run a Dance of Dreams for my players. Uh, we can also see here that this also accepts the markdown formatting, so you can get a little fancy with uh, uh, how everything's sort of arranged by using uh, elements such as headers, um, inline images, um, such as this map right here. And if I even wanted to uh, maybe reference an article or basically a sort of chapter of information um, directly in here, I can even go ahead and do that, press that button and look at all this additional information uh, that comes up right there. Uh, what appears in the stories tab um, depends on what is in the notes tab of a scene. So if I go into the notes tab of Dance of Dreams, this is all the information um, that I kind of see in the stories tab of a GM. So it's a really great way to sort of store some information at a glance that you might want to reference for your games as you're running them. Moving on from there, um, we have Game Master Actions. Now, players have an Actions tab as well. It's on the bottom left of their screen. Um, actions are sort of like small macros. Um, they're they're not all powerful and they can't do um, you know, absolutely everything in the world, but they can do a lot of really basic functions like rolling dice um, or making attacks or uh, uh, rolling uh, for a result on like a roll table, playing a sound kind of like a soundboard um, and, and, and things of that nature. And so uh, for instance, we have this, who are we meeting table from the Vason core rule book. It's a roll table that specifically generates, uh, I believe it's a male and a female first name uh, as well as a surname for uh, an individual. And so what I can do uh, for this is use the action. And it'll just kind of roll out in the, um, oh, this one isn't that one. This one's for the uh, uh, the occupation. So it basically uh, rolls a result based on a roll table, displays in the journal, and then you know I as a game master can kind of take that result from there, weave it into the narrative however I see fit. You can also create your own actions as well by going to the Add Actions button down here. Uh, and either creating an action um, or pulling one in from the Vason universe or any additional universes uh, that you have uh, already um, enabled for your game. Then you want to click into the roll table real quick to, to kind of show what it looks like in terms of yeah, I uh, can do that. How, how it's implemented? Yeah. Uh, so this is a roll table in Alchemy. Um, we give it a name uh, and a description uh, like uh, most other actions in the platform. And then we basically set the die to be rolled. So for instance, this uh, particular roll table has 36 different options. And so we can basically set a D36 table. 
Um, past that, uh, once we kind of have the number of options we want to have implemented, you can set a range um, for the die uh, value to land on where that image there, that option will be presented to everybody. In this case, these roll tables are all a uh, single result results. And so if I roll anywhere uh, between a one and a one, so basically a one on this D36, it'll print out this sort of village idiot effect um, in the, um, uh, uh, the roll table in the journal. And so it's kind of the anatomy uh, of uh, what these things are. You can set this up to basically randomize anything you need. You can basically do percentages based on, uh, you know, maybe uh, one result is like a one to a 10 on the die and another result's like an 11 or a 12. Um, you know, if, if you want to kind of add some some randomization, some chance to your game, um, maybe in, in a more specialized and specific way um, that you can with just rolling a normal die. So uh, in the case of what I just did before, uh, if we look for the soldier right here, uh, we have a retired military officer, uh, which means that I rolled a 16 um, when I used that action just a little bit earlier. But good call out, Dan. Thanks. And then finally, kind of maneuvering from actions, um, we're going to go over to handouts right now. Handouts are really good um, for those sort of tangible um, objects you might want to hand out to a table if you're playing in person. Um, so the example I constantly go to is like, maybe you want to hand out like a map of the region to everybody um, so that they can kind of make informed decisions looking at something tangible about where they want to go. Um, maybe they're invited to a uh, ball, like a royal party, um, and you want to hand them a scroll that actually has an invitation on it. Handouts would be something great for that. In this case, Nora's Journal is one of the handouts that are part of the Dance of Dreams adventure in the back of the Basin Core Rulebook. And if I go ahead and view this handout, you'll be able to see that we have a bunch of information related to these notes uh, that we have already typed up here uh, on the uh, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. But then we also have this image of these notes that's kind of printed directly from the book that we can kind of manipulate, uh, zoom in on, um, and sort of interact with um, in a more meaningful way than just looking at an image. Um, you know, when we have it kind of ported into the platform in this way. Um, you can also edit any handouts in your game. Um, so you can, you know, have it present in full screen or have it present in a small little modal like this. Um, and you can also add its content here for any information you'd want to see um, related to the, the photo or whatever's, uh, you know, assigned in the handout. To share a handout with a party, um, I can either right click and hit the share option or left click and uh, use the share option right here. And it'll bring up all of the players in the game, um, since Game Masters can by default see every handout already. And so I can either share a handout individually with, with one player, or if I had multiple players in the game, I can go ahead and just share it with everybody. And once I click uh, OK down here, the little check button, Dan was just notified on his screen with a little notification right here that a handout has been shared with him. And he can navigate to his handouts tab as a player um, and actually view uh, this handout um, in the same way that uh, I can right here. So it's a really great way for be distributing information a little more tangibly um, that your players can interact with. Uh, finally, sort of maneuvering up a little bit here, uh, just to talk about these three buttons between uh, the party panel and the bottom panels uh, right now. You can add a player using the add player button. It just brings up the players tab in the game settings. Uh, you can adjust individual volumes for players. So let's say one of your players is coming in maybe a bit louder than the rest. You can go ahead and turn them down if you need to. Um, and I'll reduce their input uh, for you so that they're not blowing your eardrums out. Um, and then finally, if you have video chat enabled for your game, you can go ahead and pop out the video drawer here. Um, and if anyone has their cameras on, which Dan and I don't since we're uh, presenting right here, um, you'll actually be able to see their videos right here uh, in the drawer. Uh, is that audio for all or just DM? It is for all. So everybody has access to uh, um, adjusting that, whether you're a player or a game master. Uh, so navigating to the party panel, this is a really good panel as a game master. For players, they can just see each other, um, see their statuses, um, which are things I'll go into in a second. But for a game master, it's super important. Um, so let's say that Dan had a character here. Um, Dan, if you want to make a character real quick on your test account, um, uh, or your, uh, yes, your test account, uh, what you'll be able to do as a game master is basically pull up their character sheet. Uh, so for instance, Dan here just made uh, Louis Gregorius here um, as a player character in Basin. And if I want to, I can go ahead and click on Louis and interact with um, that player in some way. 
first thing I can do, either by right clicking um, or by left clicking and going to the options down here, is I can go ahead and view the character sheet. So as a game master, I actually have access to all of uh, Lewis's information here. Uh, Dan just made a character really quick and it didn't generate any like additional information that's for him to sort of put in on his side. Um, but if he did have a full character sheet here, um, I'd be able to see all of his attributes, all the different features on his character sheet, all of his skills and their modifiers and things like that. Basically any information I would really want as a game master, um, just to sort of uh, keep tabs on maybe what a character is capable of doing. Uh, pass that as well. I can also uh, access his trackers. Um, so kind of like I was saying earlier, trackers are basically um, different types of objects within the game um, that you can use to track uh, uh, things like your hit points, uh, your experience points, uh, maybe you have an item that can only be used a certain amount of times, uh, basically anything with a sort of numeric value that's worth uh, kind of keeping track of, you can keep track of using a tracker. And Dan will kind of show those off a little bit more um, you know, when, when we get to his portion of this presentation. As a game master as well, um, I can hit token right here and um, uh, it will put a token in my hand for this character, which I can then uh, put on a tactical map here. Um, and then from there, they can move it around. I'll get to tactical mode in just a second here. Moving along, I can also whisper characters. So let's say that I want to whisper something to Dan or send him a private message that I don't want anyone else in the game to see. I can click whisper and uh, my uh, chat window will be populated with the command that I can use to uh, send Dan a private golden message here um, that only he can see and nobody else in the game can see uh, directly. Finally, uh, we have the status icon here. Uh, which allows players to kind of set any sort of fun status just in their sort of subheader on the party tab here. And then uh, I can also play as a character. So let's say that I kind of want to feel what a character looks like um, uh, from their sort of vantage point in the game. I can click play and suddenly a bit of my UI changes to show me some of those player panels here that I don't have access to as a game master because I uh, don't have um, uh, you know skills or abilities as a game master. Uh, and then I can also see Dan's character bar here where he gets presented with this information and his core trackers either on his trackers panel here or with these sort of flanking trackers, uh, trackers uh, on his portrait. Um, if I don't want to play as Dan anymore um, or Lewis in this case, I can go ahead and click the X button right here and it'll bring me right back to the game master view where I'm no longer playing as him. Uh, the other important thing I wanted to mention too, um, players have some different options and specifically for them when they go to view a character, they won't be able to see other characters' character sheets. So all this information um, is completely hidden uh, from players to players, um, and only a game master can kind of click in and see everybody's uh, core character sheets um, without any sort of information filtered out of them as well. Moving on over to the NPCs tab, it's very similar. Um, NPCs are, again, basically anyone that's not um, in the game as a player. Uh, and so in this case here for the Dance of Dreams adventure, I have Samuel here uh, already pre-populated into a scene, but I can always add an NPC by clicking the Add NPCs button. And it'll show me every NPC, um, in this case from the core rulebook, because we already have the core rulebook um, enabled for the game. Um, or for Dan and I, um, it'll also show us any NPCs uh, related to that universe as well. Um, all you have to do is click the Add button right here. Uh, and then click OK, and it will move right into um, uh, the uh, uh, right into the NPCs panel, uh, hidden from everybody. While you can see hidden NPCs as a game master, um, players can't. And so, if I want to actually reveal Samuel to the players, I can go ahead and drag him up uh, to the sort of uh, uh, drop zone where I can uh, reveal uh, NPCs, or I can click the NPC and click show right here as an option, and they'll automatically move up there as well and be displayed towards uh, player characters. Very similar to them, they have a lot of similar options. So again, as a game master, I can view NPC information um, and any of their attributes and information related to them. Players, when they click view, uh, normally can't see that information. I'll get to how they can in just a second. Um, similar to them, I can place an NPC's token. I can play as an NPC. Um, I can alter their trackers. Uh, and then I can hide them if I, they're already shown. And then the two other specific um, uh, operations related to NPCs is that I can share an NPC. So let's say that 
Um, maybe you're playing a game uh, and one of your players has a companion that's a bear and that's kind of their bear um, and they have access to like its statistics and its information. Um, what I could do with that uh, particular uh, uh, NPC is similar to how we were able to share handouts. I can share an NPC with a player or with the entire group. And just like that, once it's shared, uh, Dan is able to click that NPC, and instead of just seeing uh, its portrait when he clicks on them in the NPC's panel, he'll be able to see all their character sheet information as well and make any edits and modifications he needs to make um, to run his his sort of part of the uh, tabletop uh, on his side. And finally, for NPCs, uh, we have the Send to Journal button. This is really cool. Let's say I want to share uh, an NPC and kind of maybe introduce them to the scene. Instead of just uh, moving them up into the uh, to show them in the NPCs panel, I can send them to a journal, and it will display the the NPC as uh, full portrait uh, in the journal. I can click on them, um, and everyone will be able to see whatever information they're allowed to see for that NPC, um, just right there, uh, sort of at a, a pretty quick glance. If you want to just sort of present um, everybody with that sort of information. Uh, Real quick, I'm almost done with everything I gotta say. Just want to check in one one last time. Um, how's everyone doing? Pacing's good. Everyone's getting their questions answered. Um, feel free to just let me know in chat real quick. Seeing all good. Seeing a heart. Got a thumbs up. You good times. All good. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. So um, ripping through these sort of last three buttons um, on the side here, and I'll get to turn order in just a second. This one's an important one. Um, for any of you who maybe want a battle grid for your game, while Vason's not particularly um, uh, requiring like tactical combat, um, there's other RPGs out there that do, and clicking into tactical mode will allow you to view uh, a tactical map that has been uploaded to a scene. Um, it's specifically when you edit the scenes in the tactical tab, you can upload a battle map um, that will show. In this case, we just have the uh, sort of name uh, or main map of the region um that the dance of dreams takes uh place in and as you saw earlier i was able to uh drop lewis's token uh right here um and as a game master i'm able to move it around wherever i need to move it um players will always be able to move their own token um and the tokens of any npcs are shared with them uh game masters can move every token every player every npc um, that's in the game here uh, on the side here, uh, we also have, uh, when you open tactical mode, some game master tools um, specific to them. Uh, as you were seeing me uh, do earlier, I can hold down left click and move Lewis around. Um, if I wanted to, maybe I don't want to grab a token, but I want to get everyone's attention. This cathedral over here is a pretty important place for the story. And so I can actually hold left click on the map there and actually send that little sonar ping to everybody in the game. And it kind of draws their attention over that place. So if you're like, oh, which enemy are you attacking? Which uh, uh, area are you talking about? What corner, where do you want your character to move? Any player or game master can just hold down the move button and ping so that um, that gets sort of broadcasted to everybody um, you know, in the game and everyone knows specifically what you're talking about. We also have a ruler tool, which is on our right click right now, but you know, again, you can sort of move and, and sort of map these tools wherever you need. And for the ruler, if I hold it down, I can actually measure out uh, distances by squares, um, you know, for anything that might require a, a particular range, um, you know, within a uh, tactical experience. And then finally, as a game master, I also have access to fog of war tools. So if I want to cover an entire map and obscure everything, um, I can click cover all. And while myself as a game master can still see the map beneath, players actually will have this map completely hidden from them. Um, and they won't even actually know it's there. Uh, if I want to reveal certain portions of the map, I can always erase the fog with the eraser tool. Uh, whoops, that is on my right click, not my left click. And so I can go ahead and erase portions of the fog as I want to as a game master um, to reveal those sections to the players. Um, past that as well, I also have a tool that I can sort of paint to add fog um, as a game master. And all of this will just sort of show on the player's side, um, you know, from, from their perspective. So that's tactical mode um, in a nutshell. You also have your map phases here. So that if I want to uh, move to a different phase of a map, so this is great if you have like uh, seven battle maps are of the same place, but maybe it's like constantly flooding turn after turn, you can go ahead and switch to a new battle map and it will uh, uh, pull up that uh, for all the players to see. 
Um, or you can use a new scene for additional maps as well. And then I have the ability to toggle grid on and off, depending on if that type of movement actually matters for my game. Um, and then finally, you have some extra settings here relate to the map scale um, and, and the grid that sort of comes with it all. Moving back over to story mode, um, we also have our audio settings. So these are by player. Uh, if a scene has music, ambience, and sound all associated with it, it will actually you'll be able to sort of adjust these levels. So if I adjust the music up a little bit, um, you all should hear if you're in my stream in Discord right now, um, the sort of music that's starting to play uh, over the um, uh, over the the stream here. Um, this little triangle right here is specific for Alchemy Enhanced. As a part of that rulebook that you all had redeemed, um, one of the things you actually get with it is nine minutes of dynamic looping audio. And what that means is we have three separate music tracks that all kind of play over each other, um, but they can be isolated in any way needed to kind of uh, set a particular mood. So for instance, if I move the slider over towards this corner, it isolates a, a track that's very specific about, oh no, I have it turned down. You're good on my side, Vinny. Okay. Um, clear. Cool. So we have a, a kind of the sort of um, uh, string instruments sort of isolated on this track. But if I move the slider down, we have the uh, 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 the other sounds that are kind of playing the more piano uh, types of uh, music. And I believe this brings the sort of uh, drums into play. And so I can isolate these any way I need um, for this particular sound or bring it to the middle if I want all of them to play at once. It's pretty cool. Um, you all can uh, play around with it a little bit once you create your basing games on your own, um, but that's something very specific to Alchemy Enhance. It's a really awesome feature um, to really kind of help with the immersion. And then finally, we have our Omnisearch here. So right now, this is a feature specifically for game masters. If I go ahead and click, I'll have a big uh, bar pop up um, ready for me to search uh, any type of information. Uh, in the connected universe in the Vasen Core rulebook, uh, we have information based on er, articles for each archetype. And in this case, let's say I want to learn a little more information about the doctor archetype. I can go ahead and type in doctor up here and pull up the doctor article, uh, which I can either view by clicking the little eye icon right here. So I can view that archetype's information if I need to reference it um, in the game. Or very similar to what I did with an NPC before, I can go ahead and send that to the journal so that all of my players can see uh, the doctor's information um, and they can click uh, directly into it from the journal. So it's a really great way to distribute information, maybe have some home rules you want to sort of uh, 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 post in chat. Um, articles are a great thing for something like that. Yeah, speaking of Vinny, would, uh, would you mind throwing our three custom made uh, how to plays there in chat for me? Ooh, I could do that. Um, real quick, the names of those articles are the... You can go how to play and it should pop all three of them. Up. How to play. Perfect. So these are articles Dan and I had actually made in our own custom universe. So we, because we enable that in the game, um, we're able to uh, go ahead and reference those in Omnisearch. And uh, just for Dan here, I'm going to go ahead and post these all to our game, um, kind of in preparation for uh, his section of uh, his presentation, which we'll get to in just a couple minutes here. Um, and then finally, uh, the last thing you see here in the scene is the scene's title and location, which can be set uh, when you're creating the scene itself. Um, you can also add credits for any of the assets that are being used, such as the music and the environment, um, you know, because we're all about giving credit to the fantastic folks who make some really creative, really amazing stuff. Um, that we use to play our, our uh, RPGs with. So kind of in a nutshell, um, that's a pretty broad overview of the gameplay experience for the Game Master, as well as uh, a little bit of a tease for what um, the player experience looks like. Um, generally, this might differ a little bit from game to game, depending on what system you're running, um, but you can get a pretty good overview of the tool set from here and then you know kind of iterate um, your understanding from there based on whatever other system that you sort of pull up at that time. From here, um, I'm going to go ahead and toss over to Dan. Dan's going to speak a little bit more um, uh, about how to run Vasen games in Alchemy, um, now that you all have the core rulebook uh, in your accounts, uh, and also speak a little bit to our Vasen implementation uh, at large. Um, so Dan, if you're ready to go, um, I can go ahead and toss you the screen. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see it. 
Uh, so this is the player experience of Vason, and for those that don't know, Vason is a 19th century horror game based in Nordic folklore. Uh, essentially, uh, I like to tell people it's kind of like European Ghostbusters mixed with a little bit of Sherlock Holmes. That's kind of the vibe, but not necessarily what it is. You got basically a, uh, a, a very cool mystery solving uh, situation. Um, and it all kind of has to do with like boogeymen or creatures that are unseen by a normal folk. Um, you all play a set of people that have what is called the sight. And the sight allows you to see these vasen, these creatures that are unseen by other people. You are part of what is called the society. And the society is essentially the group of people that have the sight. And the society has been going on for hundreds of years. Now it's your job to go out and either hunt or uh, document or, or research these vasen for either future generations or to help the humans along their way. Now, vasen is a D6 dice pool system, meaning that you will only be rolling D6s here, and the only thing that matters is a six. So you count successes by the number of sixes that you roll whenever you roll your dice pool. Essentially, the more dice you have, the better chance you have a success. Now, the harder the situation, the GM might make the number of successes kind of grow in order to actually succeed at the thing. So for instance, all your basic rolls only require a single success when rolling. So you roll your D6s and you get one six, you succeed. The harder the difficulty, the more success is necessary. So you might need two or three to succeed on certainly much more difficult things. The first thing that we're going to do, though, is we're going to do the most, I guess, basic thing you're going to need whenever you first join a Vasen game, and that is to create a character. So here on my screen, as you can see, we already have a character, but what we're going to do is I'm going to delete this character so that way we have access to the creator. It will boot me from the game so that it resets me. When I join back in, you are met with the creator. Uh, essentially, what you're going to do is you have three boxes here. The first thing you have is a name. You can obviously create your own name or you can have a series of names created for you via our drop down or even our little random generator here. Once you select a name, you can move on to your age group. Your age group is what depicts how many attribute points and how many skill points you have in this game. The younger you are, the uh, more attributes you might have, so you're, you're a little bit more spry, a little stronger, whatever it might be, but you don't have that wisdom, so your skill points are a little bit lower. And then the exact opposite for older. The less spry you are, the less strong you might be, but you've, you're wizened over your years, and now you have more skill points. Once you select your age group here, uh, which will go into how to get your skill points in just a moment, but I'm going to go ahead and select middle age. Uh, and then you have your archetypes. Now, your archetypes are what allow you to pick your class, essentially, in this game, right? So in this game, there are several choices here. You can either randomize with our little random roller here, or you can select your own. Um, we're just going to simply go with the doctor. Uh, it looks like we've selected the doctor. And what you need to see here is, I guess, the most important parts. Um, down below the description of what a doctor is in this world, you have your stats, you have your main attribute and your main skill. All that means is essentially your main attribute, and for the doctor it's logic, you can start with a maximum of five, where normally any other attribute, uh, attribute pool is, is a maximum of only four. So with logic we can take it to five, any other pool we can only take to four. Same thing applies to skill when you first make your character. You can only go to a maximum of two unless it's your main skill. And for my doctor here, it's medicine. So my medicine can actually be a three, not a two. Everything else can be whatever you need it to be as long as it maxes out at two. Next up on this thing here is the talents. Now you can start with one single talent under your archetype. You're given three options when you first create a character. You can see the initial kind of the, the title of each of the talents here. Uh, but when we select that character, we'll actually be able to select the current talent that we want to go with with our level one character. Um, next up is the resources. Uh, resources in this game essentially are just how rich your character is. You can start at zero or you can start at, uh, I think six is probably the highest you can start at. But either way, what it means is 
kind of you're 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 on the streets at zero and you're filthy rich and you own several mansions and countryside at eight um and what this does is in the game there are shopping sections literally part of the game is uh shopping segments where you go out and buy the things the implements that you think will help you on your mystery resources will then act as dice pools for you to succeed and then use your successes to buy those items so for instance this doctor has uh i think it's four to six so uh what it'll do is me mean, it means that you will start at four and then you can raise it to six during character creation and we'll get to that here in a second um, and you will start with 46. You roll 46 when you go shopping. And if you get any successes there, then you can use those successes to go purchase your items. Last but not least on this page here is your equipment. And your equipment is auto-generated and auto-given to you. The only thing that you really need to pay attention to here is if it gives you an or option. So if it says this or that, we give you this, but if you want that, you will have to equip it on your own. And I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. So once you get all three of these things down, you will go ahead and hit that uh, check mark at the bottom. Once you uh, have done that, it will give you a blank character sheet with the archetype that you've selected now. All you need to do is click in the center of your screen, right where your avatar is, and it'll give you your character sheet. And in order to edit it, go to the top left here on the slider, click edit, and you have access to the fully customizable sheet. First thing I like to do is just go ahead and select my token size and I'll say 1-1 one, one, because again, in Basin, the battle maps are not necessarily the, uh, I guess, center point of it all, uh, but 1-1 one, one is really easy to track. Um, next up are your uh, 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 motivations, uh, your trauma, and your dark secrets. Now, motivations are essentially what has caused, or not what's caused you, what is your reason for going out and hunting these Vasin or researching these Vasin? Um, there could be any uh, sort of thing. You can either uh, create your own or you can take the selections from the book here uh, and select those or even just randomly generate, again, with our nice little random generator button. Next up is trauma, and trauma is essentially the thing that, uh, that has caused you to be able to see these Vasin. Now, the thing that happened in your past or something that is that happened recently, whatever it is, has to be traumatic in some sort of way in order to kind of trigger that sense for you to be able to see the Vasin. Uh, that has given you the sight, and that is what this, um, this trauma section is. Again, same exact thing. You can randomize, pull down from the menu, or select your own. And lastly is the dark secret and the dark secret should not be shared with anybody except for your GM. The GM should be the only one that has access to your dark secret because essentially what they're going to do is use it against you. That's right. In this, they will use your dark secret against you in order to either build on the scene or make it a little bit more uh, drama filled. Your dark secret can be anything, but like it could be a simple thing that happened in your past that you don't like talking about, or it could be a really, really distressing thing that can change the entire outlook of the adventure. Uh, next up after that is the relationships tab. You can add relationships if you'd like. All you need to do is click the add relationships. If there's anybody in the game already as players, you drop down and you should have access to their character names like right there and then. If you don't, you can simply type their name in the box here and then type the type of relationship you may have with their characters. Be brothers you could be uh distant uh relatives you could have be co co-workers whatever it might be uh you can just write in your relationships as is you can also do that with npcs uh next up is the talents section so as i said before when you create your character when you create your archetype you're given a choice of three different talents that you can choose from once you look at these and as you can see the talents have the description of what all of the uh all of them are underneath it um, once you choose the one that you want, all you need to do is go in and delete the other two. So I'm going to pick Army Medic as my uh, selection here. So all I need to do is go over to the other two talents that I'm not taking and simply go to the little carrot and drop down to the bottom and remove it. And then that will fill my character sheet in saying I have selected Army Medic. Uh, next up, we have we have insights, defects, and advantages. Insights in uh, in this game essentially, and uh, insights and defects are given to you if you reach your critical health uh, pool. So essentially, what happens in this game, you don't have 
uh, hit points. You actually take conditions when it comes to damage. You have two types of conditions. You have mental and you have physical conditions. And you can take up to three points of damage in each one of your mental or physical conditions. If you take a fourth point in either your mental or physical conditions, you will be considered broken, either physically or mentally. If you become broken, you will have to roll on a critical injuries table, and by doing so, it will then incur either an insight or a defect to your character, which will either be a boon or a bane to them in terms of having to either add or subtract to your dice pool. Last, you have the advantages here on this page, and uh, what that means in this game is basically all you do is you'll be adding two to a roll, two dice to a roll, 2d6, right? So for instance, if they uh, go and do something that would give them an advantage later on in the game, so uh, they do research on a character and they learn his true name, um, they then have the true name advantage that if they use it later on and they go to manipulate them or they go to do anything with them in the future, they get that bonus and they can use that bonus one time. So they basically get an advantage on the roll and all that advantage means is you just add two to the dice pool. So for instance, if they have Manip if they're trying to manipulate them later on and they have a dice pool of four, but they have advantage on the roll, their dice pool turns into 66 versus 46. And that goes for many different advantages. You can hold a single advantage as a player, but you can give multiple advantages out to the party. Next up, you have the stats on the top and stats are depicted again by your age group that you selected. Now, if you select uh, this lovely thing that I had made for this pri uh, previously on the how to play section, uh, creating a character will allow you to see uh, some specialized tables that uh, will give you a little bit more insight on the age groups here. Now, each one, again, like I said, is depicted differently depending on what you pick, but we're going to go with the middle age one, which it gives me 14 and 12 uh, attribute and skill points um, respectfully so I'm going to go ahead and click out of that I know how many skill points I have and go back to my stats now I know logic was my uh, my kicker right it was my main uh, my main attribute so I can go ahead and put that at five because I know that maxes out at five uh, so you can put your logic at five but note that each um, one of your attributes can only go up to four unless it's your main attribute now we have a few to choose from again because we have a pool to choose from but when it comes to attributes you have a minimum of two so you have two in each of the uh, selections here minus logic that can go up to a five so if we add it all up we have five six seven eight nine ten eleven that we've already used we have three more that we can kind of place around where we'd like as long as you make sure that they maximize at four you're good to go and you can place them wherever you wish now the same thing goes for skills. You have that pool to choose from and you just place them wherever you'd like. All you do is simply click on the uh, the skill that you want to up. Uh, we'll say medicine. We know that is our main skill. We can go over to the skill value and plus, plus, plus and gives us a three because that is our main skill. We can maximize at three. We can put that to a three. Now, anything else, we kind of just grab and pull wherever we want uh, while we go into character creation. Uh, there can be zeros. Um, and again, as long as everything else maximizes that two, you're good to go. Moving on to the next section is kind of where we pull in the uh, the where you start from resources to where you can build to. Now, in character creation, you saw that in resources, there was a number through a number. For instance, for the medic, or for the doctor, it was four through six when it comes to resources. You'll start at four, but during character creation, you can go up to six. And in order to raise your resources, when you create your character for the first time, you'll have to steal one of your skill points that you've used and place it in your resources. So you would take, for instance, uh, we added to our stealth here. I'm going to take one away from my stealth and I'm just going to add it to my resources. And now instead of a four resources, I have a five in my resources. Next up are the equipment that we've been given. Again, like I said, we auto equip you with everything. Just make sure that you go over here and click on the little circle that will uh, 
that will actually equip the item versus it just being in your inventory. And by equipping that item, it will activate different actions that are related to that item. So for instance, if you look at these items here, these will give you benefits to certain aspects. If for instance, I can inspire with this alcohol, meaning that it will give me a bonus to my inspire rule if I use the alcohol during the roll. Um, all you would need to do in order to gain that bonus is just by clicking on the action. And we'll do that here in just a second. Now, if you need an item, simply click add item and it's in your inventory. Next up is the armor type and your armor type in this, you just go out and buy it whenever you have that shopping phase. Armor, the way it works is that it, it, it can uh, reduce the amount of damage that you'll be taking. Um, so for instance, if you take damage and we'll say it's two conditions worth of damage, your medium armor will have four. The number will be four. And basically that just means that you have four D6 to roll from. You're going to roll 4d6 and any successes will then count uh, against the amount of damage that you've taken. So for instance, you've taken two conditions worth of damage, you roll 4d6 and you gain one success. That means you reduce the damage by one and you only take one condition of damage. The caveat to wearing armor is that your agility will go down respectfully in terms of the, harbor, the heavier your armor, the less agile you'll be. And then lastly, on this page is a very, very important portion of this, and that is called mementos. And mementos is a another word for a self heal in Vasin. At any point during a session, somebody can take one of these mementos here. Uh, you can select from the list or you can randomize it or create your own. Of course, you could take a memento and use it in a scene in whatever way the player wants to use it. Um, and try to recover from a mental condition or a physical condition, whatever it is, but they can recover up to two mental or physical conditions from this, depending on how the GM wants to interpret it. Um, they can only use it once per session, but it is a nice self heal. Our tracker shows our health pools, right? Our physical and mental, uh, capacities. And then we have our actions that I said are implemented due to our items. Once we have uh, gained all the things we need to in order to uh, have our character fully fleshed out, um, you just go ahead and hit that check mark at the bottom. Make sure you don't hit the X because that will delete all the work we've just done. Go ahead and hit that check mark at the bottom and you have your character. Now that we have our character fully fleshed out, uh, you can make rolls however you wish now uh, with your skill panel here. So if you want to make a medicine check, you can left click it and then go to the middle here and check. Let me go back to here. Or you can right click it and check it that way as well. There we go. One success on either one. I succeed on whatever I do in my medicine world. <laughs> um, in this game, your, uh, your health again is depicted by conditions. So what you'll do is if you take damage for whatever reason, you take a physical damage or a mental damage, you will go over to the right hand side where it says trackers and you'll click the little carrot on the right hand side of that. You will bring it'll bring up a list of the top four being physical and the bottom four being mental conditions that you'll be taking. So, for instance, I take, let's say, two physical conditions and I will click the first one and I will click the second one and it will give me my two conditions. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I take two physical conditions, that means that my physical dice pools right here, these two on the left, will then be reduced by that many. So for instance, I'm conditioned, I have two conditions, two physical conditions, my dice pool will be reduced by two. So I was originally rolling four, uh, and now I should only be rolling two. There we go. So now that I have those conditions, you know, I might want to use my memento to heal them or find a way to heal them in a certain way so that my dice pools are more successful. Now, in this game, when you fail a dice roll, you have the option of uh, re-rolling or pushing a roll. If you push a roll, that essentially means that you can try again to succeed. If you succeed, that's great. You did great and you succeed on the roll, whatever it might be. But whether you succeed or fail, if you push a roll, you will take a condition. Now, whether it's a physical condition or a mental condition is up to your GM. 
All right. Kind of moving on from here. Um, I'm going to be linking in chat these uh, articles that you can uh, read on your own. You can check out if you would like uh, on your own time. Um, and then the next thing we're going to talk about is the uh, the NPC panel. So we're going to move over to the GM's uh, view of things here on in Basin. And we're going to click into our game. And we should have access to the turn order now. All right. So we have the turn order ready to go. And in Vasin, initiative is normally tracked by a deck of 10 cards. You basically hold them out. Everybody draws a card and you depict who goes first, uh, depending on what number you have there. Um, if in, in, in Alchemy, it's simplified even more by all you have to do is click turn order and everybody in the game will have their uh, turn automatically given to them. It will also automatically sort them on the right hand side. So simple as that. The only thing is, is there is a caveat. If somebody has the ability to roll twice per se, uh, on their initiative, they would just go into chat right here and slash, uh, type in slash roll one D 10, and they would have access to the dice roller. And then you just pick the better of the two or whatever the player wants to choose. And if they choose one that actually changes their initiative or changes where they might be in the turn order, easiest thing to do is go over to the right hand side and drag and drop them wherever they might be respectfully. The under, uh, the only other thing that it changes kind of in, in Vason is the fact that if you get extra successes during combat, for whatever reason, you can kind of change positions, literally change and swap initiative cards with different people in combat. All you need to do is drag and drop them around. Simple as that. Um, and the last thing would be is if a Vasin or an enemy has multiple turns in combat, all you would need to do is create a secondary uh, NPC uh, or a copy or a duplicate NPC for them and just drag and drop them into initiative. And you can put them wherever that second initiative might be. And then boom, you've got your person right there. You got the whatever monster or creature that you're fighting two places in initiative. And you can easily just kind of shift through initiative by hitting that next turn button right there and just kind of flow through it just like that. Um, so last thing I want to kind of touch on really quick is uh, if at the very end of a game um, you are successful or you, you know, you complete your session, whatever it might be, leveling up will take place. Now, in these games, uh, you will be asked at the very end of a session a series of questions. At that point, what you'll do is once you answer these questions you and, and you answer yes to any of these questions, you will be given one XP per question. So you answer these questions, you keep going and you build up a pool of XP. You can then spend that XP in two different ways. You can either spend five XP on a new skill point. So you take basically one skill point and put it anywhere you would like up to a maximum of five in any skill. Because this game, you can only roll a max of 10 dice, so you would have five on your main attribute and five on your whatever skill you have completely maxed out. Um, or you can take that five XP, instead of spending it on a skill, you can then spend it on an ability. Now, when you started your character, your, uh, your, your, your archetype, you only had a selection of three from your specific archetype. When you level up and you spend five XP on an ash, or, uh, on a, um, uh, an ability, you can gain any one of the abilities in the game. So you can you can take another character's ability. You can take um, a general uh, talent, excuse me, talents, uh, take any general talent, any of the other players talents, anything like that, and you will gain access to it that way by using that five XP to do so. As well as the that leveling up component goes, you uh, are, are kind of uh, shown an even deeper uh, gameplay uh, scenario if you do long-term gameplay. So for instance, if you do more than one mystery or you do several mysteries in a row, whatever it might be, um, though that might include many, many, many sessions. Uh, in between those mysteries, you actually have a base building aspect. You will be given a castle uh, that you can then build up on, discover things, uh, higher hirelings and everything like that to help give you benefits to your future mysteries 
uh, and, and kind of help you to solve these, uh, these crises or whatever it might be that you're going after. Um, and after every single one of the um, uh, uh, mysteries versus the end of a session, uh, which may be several sessions in a mystery, after you finish a mystery, the same thing happens uh, as when you finish up uh, a session with a character. You'll be asked a series of questions about the mystery, and if you answer yes to any of those, you'll be given development points, and those development points go towards your castle. Now, how do you track that in alchemy? Well, that's simple. All you need to do is treat it like an NPC. So what you do is go to your add NPCs plus button over here on your NPCs panel. You're going to create a character and then the NPC type will be headquarters. And that is where we will have our headquarters. Now, I like to make it a huge token uh, because when you drop it down on the, the map, it makes a, a big old a uh, nice big token for you and you can have a cool little picture for you and at the end of every mystery like i said you can answer those questions for development points now you can add the location and the type of building it may be whatever if it's not a castle it could be whatever you want now in the core rule book you are given a castle called like a castle gillenkreutz or whatever <laughs> I, i'm not exactly sure the exact pronunciation but it is a castle that you are given and uh you can build upon that um, but as you get development points, you can then spend them on adding facilities to your castle, uh, discovering hidden facilities inside of your castle. Uh, you might discover secrets that weren't there uh, that you didn't have to begin with. Um, going out and, and finding contacts that might be able to help you in future missions, and then also hiring personnel just to work your castle. Uh, you could have something uh, as simple as like maybe let's say an armory or whatever you might want, uh, a botanical garden, um, all kinds of stuff, basically adding to your castle like as your missions go on. Um, and once you are done here on this sheet, all you need to do is simply uh, click the uh, button at the bottom. Then what you'll do is take that and I'll, what I like to do, of course, is share this with my my group because I want them to have access to their castle. So I'll right click it. I'll share it to everybody. And now they have access to it. And what's really neat is when you click it and view it, you have this awesome looking card. Now, of course, you can change the image to be, you know, the image of your actual building or castle that you have access to so that it's a very cool, uh, like it's a very cool representation of your house, right? Your, your big uh whatever it is, you kind of go back to your home base. Um, and then you have the location, the building, how many dev points. And of course you can actually save up your development points. So that way you can buy like more expensive uh, facilities or whatever it might be. And then it has all of this uh, character sheet information showing you all the things that you've purchased and the benefits of, of them all. Um, as well as if you want to write a history of the building or keep a journal of the different things that you've done around the headquarters, everybody has access to that and can edit that as they wish. And that is that. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to Vinny real quick uh, so we can have some final remarks and then uh, we'll finish the whole thing up. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks, Dan. Um, feel free to drop your screen when you can. And I'll go ahead and pull up our last little old, uh, old slide here. Um, so thank you all for coming um, and watching. Uh, you know, we know this was pretty long uh, uh, um, uh, video here, um, but uh, we know that there's a lot of really useful information in here uh, that can really help you uh, set up your uh, games in Alchemy um, and Run Basin um, here and beyond. So just leave you with a couple more resources. Um, if there was something here that uh, didn't answer your question, um, I want to make sure that you know where to go for more answers. Uh, so the first additional resource that I kind of want to go over is our Discord. Um, you can join our Discord at discord.gg slash alchemyrpg. Um, we have an awesome community uh, of uh, active members, staff, and moderators uh, that are more than willing to answer any questions you have. Whether you want to put in feature requests, uh, you know, uh, need help from a staff member around something, or maybe you just want to get a best practice from another community member on how they might have implemented something, um, you can join our Discord. We have a ton of people willing to help you out. Uh, the second thing as well, um, we do have a support email address. It's support at alchemyrpg.com. Um, you can uh, email that address at any point um, and get in touch with uh, an Alchemy staff member. Generally, it will probably be me. Um, and I generally recommend that email for pretty much anything, um, but especially things that can only be answered by staff, 
like a, a billing concern, for instance. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have a pretty great knowledge base um, that's available within the app. Uh, if you click on the game settings icon, the gear icon in the game, and then select the help menu option, or if you click the question mark symbol at the bottom of the left navigation bar on the homepage, um, you can go ahead and bring up our knowledge base. It, it really builds well off of all the information that you all have learned here today um, and serves as a fantastic resource uh, diving into some of the more advanced areas of the platform. Um, that's basically it from us. Uh, Dan, do you just want to kind of give us a quick outro? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Go for it. All right. Thank you all so much for watching. If you are watching on YouTube or wherever you may find this video on the internet, I, I appreciate you. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that follow button, uh, subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, that way uh, you can catch any future uh, updates for, for the system or even if we had do any more uh, learn to play initiatives. Um, you know, this might be a uh, a cool intro to Vason, but we might do some more games here in the future. Uh, and if you like this video and leave a comment, let us know what you liked uh, about what uh, what we're doing here. Uh, we can always, uh, you know, improve and, and give you the best kind of review possible. And uh, so with that, thank you all for watching. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much to Vinny and everybody that is attending this in uh, live and in person. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, and we will see you all on the next one. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.